Good morning, church. Good morning. It's good to see you here this morning for worship. Hey, I want to show a picture up on the screen of somebody. Maybe you recognize this person. Nobody, no one cares. Oh, you applaud for them. That's cool too, you know. If you don't know who that is, that is okay. I will forgive you. That is Kurt Warner. Um, Kurt Warner played for the St. Louis Rams back in the day. Um, it was a lot of fun for me as a kid getting to watch Kurt Warner play football along with the rest of the St. Louis Rams. And uh, just recently, his movie came out, The American Underdog, last year. And it was a really fun movie just to get to learn more about Kurt Warner's story, especially being a big fan of the Rams and getting to learn more about him and his story. And you learn in that movie, and just when you learn about Kurt Warner's life, Kurt Warner had this extremely successful NFL career, but it didn't start out that way. His story starts with a lot of trials and uphill battle. Let me just give you some examples of some of the things the way Kurt Warner's career started out. It'll be up on the screen. First of all, Kurt Warner had no Division I scholarship offers. If you know anything about football, you want to play in the Division I if you want to go to the NFL. He got none of them, not a single one, and he ended up playing for a school in Iowa, northern Iowa. Typically, guys go to college for about four years. Well, Kurt Warner went for five years, and he didn't start until his fifth and final year uh, for the Northern Iowa football team. Not a really successful way to get into the NFL. Well, the NFL draft comes along, and nobody picks Kurt Warner. Not a single team. Every team overlooks him. He gets signed by an NFL team as an undrafted, or excuse me, undrafted free agent and gets cut. In fact, he gets cut twice by two NFL teams. Eventually, he starts playing arena football in the Arena Football League there for a couple years, and finally has some success in there and makes it to an NFL team, the St. Louis Rams. But not as a starter, but as the backup, the second string. And as it all went down, as maybe you know, Trent Green was supposed to start, and he breaks his knee basically that preseason, and Kurt Warner isn't placed as the starter because of his good play, but because of injury, and the rest is history. He goes on that season to start for the St. Louis Rams. Here's where it starts to get good. He becomes the starting quarterback for the greatest show on turf. He wins an NFL MVP that year. He leads his team to the Super Bowl. They win the Super Bowl, and he's named Super Bowl MVP. He's named another time NFL MVP. He's a four-time Pro Bowler, and ultimately he makes it into the Hall of Fame. Kurt Warner is one of the greatest quarterbacks to ever play the game of football. But without a doubt, Kurt Warner had an uphill battle to find success in the NFL. He had roadblocks, obstacles, herders, hurdles, and he faced opposition after opposition. Facing opposition. We don't like to face opposition, right? We would like to avoid that at all costs. We don't like to face resistance. We don't want things to be made harder for us, right? We want things to be made easier. Because when things are easier, we get them faster. They become better. Our culture and society has been trying to make things easier, faster, and better since the dawn of time. The improvement of transportation and communication. Uh, the improvement of the way we sleep with mattresses. The improvement of shoes to help us walk and to run. We want things to be easier, faster, and better. We don't want opposition. But what if easier wasn't the best? What if instead of trying to avoid opposition... What if we embraced it? What if we viewed opposition as an opportunity? What would happen if you and I viewed opposition as an opportunity? We are in our series, Unmistakable Marks That Marked a Movement. Unmistakable, the marks that marked the movement of the early church. We've been looking at the early church found in the book of Acts, looking at the characteristics of these first Christians and what they chose to do and how they chose to act and ultimately how those characteristics helped them to change the, word through the world through spreading the gospel. In our passage this morning, we're going to continue studying this early church and looking at this movement and a mark they have that we want to follow as well. This morning, we are going to look at Acts chapter 3 and Acts chapter 4. So if you want to go there in your Bibles, Acts chapter 3, tap on your phone to go there. That's where we're going to be this morning. And in our passage, we're going to look at some of Jesus' 12 disciples seeing some opposition. And we're going to learn from them what our response should be to opposition when we face, face opposition in our faith. So what should our response be? What should we do when you and I face opposition when it comes to living out our faith for Jesus. That's what we need to figure out this morning. What should our response be to opposition? Well, we're going to look at this story found in the book of Acts. 
Now, so far in the book of Acts, we have learned that the early church, that they were devoted to their faith and to participating in this movement of the church, taking care of each other, meeting together. And we learned just at the end of chapter 2 of of the book of Acts that the church has grown to over 3,000 people. Peter has preached to the people in Jerusalem celebrating the Jewish holiday of Pentecost and called people to repent and to be baptized for the gifts of the sins and the gift of the Holy Spirit. We've learned that God has sent his Holy Spirit to his followers, to his disciples, to be empowered and to speak boldly for Jesus. And we have learned ultimately that Jesus gave the mission to his disciples to go and make more disciples. Well, now in Acts chapter 3, we find two of Jesus' original 12s, Peter and John. Peter and John are going to the temple in Jerusalem to have an encounter with a number of different people. So we're going to start right in verse 1 and see what happens as these two guys do some mighty things and face some mighty opposition. Acts 3.1, the author Luke records. One day, Peter and John were going up to the temple at the time of prayer at 3 in the afternoon. Now, the temple was the primary place of worship for the Jewish people, and it says that Peter and John went there at 3 o'clock. This isn't just some arbitrary time. This is an important time because 3 o'clock was one of the two hours that Jewish people would go to pray, specifically at this time. So that means there would be a large number of Jews, like thousands of Jewish people would be at the temple to pray. Now, it's likely Peter and John are going at this time specifically so they can share the gospel with as much people as possible. That's why they choose to go there at 3 o'clock. In verse 2 it says, Now a man who was lame from birth was being carried to the temple gate called Beautiful, where he's put every day to beg from those going into the temple courts. So Luke records that there's a man outside the temple, outside the temple gate that goes there every day. It says this man has been lame or crippled. He's crippled. He can't walk. He's been that way since birth. We later learn in Acts chapter 4, verse 22, an important detail about this man, that he's over the age of 40. So for four plus decades, he has been crippled. And for decades, he's been outside this temple waiting for people to enter and to give him money. Now, the details say that he's brought there every day. That would let us know that he's got some family and some friends that are helping meet his basic physical needs, allowing him to be taken there and taking care of him. But he also was there hoping to get money to provide for his own personal needs. And that day, that guy was just hoping to rely on these religious people to feel sorry for him and to love him out of their good nature. But what that guy didn't know, that he was going to have an amazing encounter that day that he never dreamed of. And Peter and John get to meet this guy. And Luke records in verse 3. When he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for money. Peter looked straight at him, as did John. Then Peter said, look at us. So the man gave them his attention, expecting to get something from them. So Peter and John run into this guy, they meet him, and the guy typically, he asks them, hey, can I have some money? Can you give me some money? And Peter and John look straight at him, and then they say, look at us. This is uncommon. I doubt many people ever told this cripple guy to look back at him. And likely this cripple guy's thinking, oh man, they're really going to give me a large sum of money. They're really going to take care of me. They want me to pay attention to what they're about to give me. But what this guy doesn't realize is he's going to get something so much better than silver and gold. And here's what Luke records in verse 6. Then Peter said, silver or gold I do not have, but what I do have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. Taking him by the right hand, he helped him up, and and instantly the man's feet and ankles became strong. He jumped to his feet and began to walk. Then he went with them into the temple courts, walking and jumping and praising God. Peter lets know, I don't have what you want. Peter didn't have what he wanted in the moment, but what Peter had was something this man wanted deep down all along for his life, and that was to be healed. And Peter heals his man in the name of Jesus Christ, and he commands him to walk. And Peter slowly helps him stand, and the man stands for the first time, takes steps for the first time, and quickly this leads to amazement and healing in this man's life. Now, not only does he begin to walk, this man begins to do things he's never done before. He begins to jump. He begins to run. He begins to praise God that he can now walk and move about for the first time in his life. This is an amazing display of the power of God for someone to be healed for four decades to now be able to walk. And now the man enters into the temple for the first time ever in his life because, you see, in Jewish religious law, if you were crippled, if you were lame, you were not allowed to enter into the temple. So for the first time, this man enters into the temple, and guess what? 
people take notice. Because like I said, he's 40 years old. People know this guy. They see him every day as they walk into the temple. And now they see this guy who normally is on his butt, sitting on the ground, walking around, jumping and running around and praising God. He has got their attention. And not only does he got their attention, Peter and John now have the people's attention. In Acts 3.10 it says, they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. They were wondered and amazed at this wonderful sight. And then in Luke 11, excuse me, not Luke 11, in verse 11, Luke says the people run up to Peter and John in Solomon's colonnade. That's an important detail to know because this is the biggest room in the temple. It could fit thousands of people. And there are thousands of people there about to hear the word of God from the mouth of Peter. So it started in verse 12 in chapter 3, all the way to the end of chapter 3. Peter, Peter preaches the gospel to the people, and his message is clear. He says, God has glorified Jesus, and he lets them know, but you crucified him. You murdered him. And then Peter says, God raised him from the dead, and Peter and John are witnesses of this. And Peter says, the prophets predicted, they said that Jesus would suffer. And then Peter tells them to respond, to do something to the gospel message. He says in verse 19, repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out that times of refreshing may come from the Lord. He tells them, turn away from your sins, repent. Turn towards God, accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, and you will feel a time of refreshing. Peter is bringing it. He is bringing the gospel message. I only can imagine he's doing it passionately and filled with boldness. He is living on mission for Jesus. He has seen an opportunity that people are ready to listen, and he is preaching the gospel. Now, there are thousands of people listening, including some priests, the captain of the temple guard, who's the muscle of the temple, he's like the police force, and the Sadducees. Now, in verse 1 of chapter 4, it says these religious leaders, along with the temple muscle, come along and see Peter and John, and they're not big fans of what Peter is having to say like the other thousands of people. In fact, they don't like it at all. Here's what Luke records in verse 2 and 3 of chapter 4. They were greatly disturbed, these religious leaders, because the apostles were teaching the people, proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection of the dead. They seized Peter and John, and because it was evening, they put them in jail until the next day. This group is greatly disturbed, Luke says. They, see, these guys, they don't believe that Jesus is who he says he is. And these Sadducees, who are like the high priest, they're like the Pharisees, they didn't believe in the resurrection of the dead. So they think it's totally wrong that Jesus could ever raise from the dead. And they want to stop this as soon as possible. So they seize Peter and John, and they throw them in jail. And it's so late in the day, they have to wait till the next day. So Peter and John have to spend the night in jail for healing a man and preaching the gospel of Jesus. That seems like a major bummer of some amazing events that happened at the temple that day. It was a quite an eventful day. But the power of God moved through that healing and through the speaking of Peter. And it says in Acts 4.4, but many who heard the message believed. So the number of men who believed grew to about 5,000. 5,000 more people that day gave their lives to Jesus to become disciples of Jesus because of what they saw and what they heard. So for the first time, Peter and John are facing opposition in a real way with claiming Jesus and who he was and what he can do. And they're faced was some major opposition. They had to spend the night in jail, and the next day they have to go on trial. They have to go on trial before the Sanhedrin. Now, the Sanhedrin was the ruling court of the Jewish people. They were the religious leaders of the day that would judge their religion and, and deal with those things inside the Jewish temple. And in verse 6, Luke lets us know there's some specific people a part of this Sanhedrin. He let us know that Annas, the high priest, and Caiaphas are both there. Now, this is key. Both of these men were present during the trial of Jesus. These men were part of putting Jesus on trial and wanting to execute him and to murder and crucify Jesus. The same two men that wanted to end Jesus, to remove Jesus from this world, and they, they failed, now want to remove the disciples and remove them from sharing the name of Jesus. So Peter and John have their backs against the wall. This could be their end if they're not quite careful. So they ask Peter and John a simple question, those religious leaders. In Acts 4, 7, they say, by what power or what name did you do this? They want to know, hey, how are you able to do this? How do you claim to be able to perform this miracle? 
Well, now it's go time for Peter and John. They have to either choose to cower and shrink back of fear of what could happen to them or to stand their ground and be strong. And Luke records that Peter is filled with the Holy Spirit to speak, meaning God is giving him power and words what to say. What Peter is about to say are not from Peter, but are directly from God. And Peter begins to teach and to preach and to be on the offense instead of the defense. He goes on to say to these men um, that the healing that was done that day was because of the power of Jesus. And Peter goes on to say, you crucified that man. You crucified that man. You murdered him. But Jesus was raised from the dead by God. And he says that Jesus is the cornerstone of faith. And he goes on to say in verse 12, salvation is found in no one else, for there's no one other name under heaven given to mankind by which you must be saved. Like I said, Peter's supposed to be on the defense here, trying to defend himself from harm. But no, he is on the offense. He's calling them out on their sin and calling them out what they did. And he's ultimately saying something they don't want to hear, that Jesus is the Son of God and salvation only comes from Jesus Christ. This is a bold and brave and courageous speech by Peter. And he blows these guys away. Luke records that these men are astonished by his courage. They say, these men are unschooled, ordinary men. They know there's nothing special about Peter and John. These are just a couple of fishermen. But they do take note that these men are special because they spent quality time with Jesus. So now the Sanhedrin has to decide what to do. What do we do with these two men? Because ultimately they want them to stop talking about Jesus. So they come together, they decide what to do, and they tell Peter and John to stop sharing the message of Jesus. But they have no grounds to punish them. They can't punish them for committing a miracle. There's, there's no way to do that. So they just say, you need to stop talking about Jesus. They say, um, then they called them in again and commanded them not to speak or to teach at all in the name of Jesus. And I love Peter and John's response in verse 19 and 20 of chapter 4 of Acts. But Peter and John replied, which is right in God's eyes, to listen to you or to him? You be the judges. As for us, we cannot help speaking about what we have seen and heard. These religious leaders know who they're supposed to listen to. They're supposed to listen to God. And Peter and John may say, we're not going to listen to you. We're going to listen to God. We're going to follow God's direction. And then the ultimate say, we're just saying what we've seen and heard. We are talking about the Jesus we have seen and heard about that we've seen raised from the dead. We are not going to stop preaching the name of Jesus. And they let him go. And they let him go. This is an amazing display that Peter and John put on for us on what to do when we face opposition. Because Peter and John face opposition in a big way. And I believe these men didn't see their opposition as a setback, but viewed it as an opportunity. And what did they do? What was their response to this opposition? Was it to back down? Was it to cower? Was it to run away? No. It was to stand their ground, to be daring and to be strong. And in the face of opposition, these men chose to respond with boldness. They chose to respond with boldness in the face of opposition. What if you and I viewed opposition as an opportunity? What could happen if we did that? What things could we do? What could we accomplish for Jesus? What if we viewed opposition as an opportunity? Answer, we would make bold moves. You and I would make bold moves in our faith. We would do bold things like Peter and John did that day. We would change our lives. We would change the lives of other people. And we would change the world. Because we chose to view opposition as an opportunity and chose to respond to opposition with boldness. And that was the mark of the early church. The unmistakable mark of the early church is in the face of opposition, we respond with boldness. The early church guys faced opposition after opposition. Constantly, people were trying to stop the message of Jesus. This was only the beginning. Soon, beatings would happen. People would be thrown in jail, and eventually people would be murdered for calling on the name of Jesus and teaching and preaching and proclaiming the name of Jesus. And time and time again, the early church did not run away. They did not hide, but they responded with boldness. And thousands upon thousands of people were led to Jesus Christ. And 2,000 years later, almost a billion people around the world love and follow Jesus. Because that mark of that early church was to respond with opposition with boldness. What would happen 
if we chose to respond with boldness when we faced opposition. We would make bold moves. Church today, our call, our direction, what we are to do is to be a church that is bold, that has this mindset of being bold. Now, that sounds really good, doesn't it? I see some of you smiling. You're like, yeah, I like the sound of that. I like the sound of being bold and spreading the gospel. But let's, let's just let's calm, down. let's calm down here for a second. That sounds a little scary, right? It's a little intimidating. We start to, all of a sudden, our fears, our doubts, our insecurities come in. I don't have what it takes to be bold. I don't have the skills to be bold. I don't know if I can have that boldness that Peter and John had. Understand this today, church. Boldness is not a skill. It's a mindset. Boldness is not a skill that you are born with. No, it's a mindset that you can develop and that you can have. Case in point, Peter and John. Those religious leaders made an observation about these two men. They were unschooled, ordinary men. There was nothing special about these guys. They were literally two fishermen. That was their job, to catch fish. They weren't born with some set of skills to be bold. In fact, we rewind back to the night Jesus is arrested. Peter lacks courage, lacks boldness. He denies Jesus three times to people that can't do anything to him because he feared for his life. Fast forward to now, he knows his life is in danger. He knows he could lose it all, but he doesn't care. He has changed his mindset to be bold. So this shows you and me that we can change our mindset if we're timid, we're scared, we lack boldness and courage. So how do we change our mindset? That's what we want to do this morning. We want to develop the same bold mindset as Peter and John. So how do we change our mindset? Maybe you've experienced this yourself or you've heard stories. Some of you maybe aren't as technology advanced as the person sitting next to you. And, you, and maybe you're the person on the other end who's received the phone call. You know how it goes. You're working on some type of piece of technology and, you're, and you can't turn it on. Whether it's your TV, computer, phone, and you just can't turn it on. And you're just, you're, you've done everything you could do to try to turn it on. And then you're just like, all right, I got to call someone. And you call your friend, you call your family member that knows how to use these things. And they go through some questions. And then they ask this question to you that might be a little irritating, but it's important. Well, is it plugged in? And you're like, well, of course it's plugged in. I'm not that dumb. Why would I not plug it in? Well, you go back to inspect where it's plugged in and you find this. <laughs> and you're like, yeah, it is plugged in, but it's not plugged in in the right spot. This is a true story. This actually happened. Someone on customer service says, we've seen this phone call and this has happened. You can go nowhere real fast connecting to the wrong power source. And in order to change the mindset of being timid to having a bold mindset, we need to connect to the power source. And the power source is Jesus Christ. If you stay connected to Jesus, you have true power to be boldness. Not ourselves, not some help, some self-help guru or book, but to Jesus. Jesus is the one true person that gives us power in the mindset that we need to have to be bold and have a bold mindset. That's what Peter and John did that day. They relied on the power of Jesus. Peter talked about, we did this in the name of Jesus. We had the ability to do this miraculous healing because of the power of Jesus. And I can't help but believe and think that day when Peter and John were being bold uh, before those people, they went back and thought what Jesus said to him, said to them the night before he was crucified about staying connected to him. Here's what Jesus said to Peter and John and the other disciples that Thursday night. John 15, 5. I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Peter and John took that passage, took what Jesus said to heart. Peter proclaimed that day before the Sanhedrin that the things he did was because the power of Jesus, because he was connected to him. He had a relationship with him and he relied on him. In this passage, Jesus says he is the vine, meaning he is the power source to the branches, which is his followers. And when the branches stay connected, the followers of Jesus stay connected to the vine who is Jesus, we bear fruit, meaning we do good things, meaning our actions, our words, our lives show we love and follow Jesus. We make more followers of Jesus. We are bold. And the way we do that is staying connected to the power source in Jesus Christ. Because you can do nothing without doing that. Jesus says that himself. You will not share your faith. 
You will not give or serve. You will not love. You will do nothing in the name of Jesus. So to remain in Jesus, as he says, to mean have a personal relationship with him, rely and trust on him, to pursue a relationship with him. The more you stay grounded in that relationship with Jesus, the more powerful you become. Hear that, church. The more grounded you stay in your relationship with Jesus, the more powerful you are to do good things for Jesus. So spend time knowing and memorizing God's word, reading the Bible, pursuing a relationship with Jesus through prayer, talking and listening to him, relying on other followers of Jesus to pour into you and to give you encouragement. Are you pursuing that relationship with Jesus? Are you staying connected to God? Are you asking Jesus to show you how to live your life and to do good works? Because if you want the mindset of boldness, you must stay connected to Jesus to pursue a relationship with him. For some of you in this room, maybe you've never given your life to Jesus. You're hearing this for the first time, or maybe you've heard it before, and you're just like, I, I'm on the fence about following Jesus. But you're here. That means to me you're curious, you're interested. And I know there's a lot of different reasons why we might not want to put our trust in Jesus, why we might have our, our stipulations or different things get in the way. But I want you to understand this. Trusting Jesus for the first time is a bold move. It's a bold move to give your life to Jesus. It's a bold step to follow Jesus, to make him the leader of your life, to surrender all that you are and give him direction. That takes boldness. And maybe for you today, your bold step is to giving your life to Jesus, to starting that process. And that bold move can be difficult and be hard, but it's the best decision you will ever make in your life. So for some of you, it's pursuing a relationship with Jesus for the first time. To get boldness. For some of you, it's reconnecting with Jesus, making a stronger connection so that you can continue to make bold moves in the face of opposition. So if you and I want to have the mindset of boldness, we need to stay connected to the power source in Jesus Christ. So a movie that my wife and I really enjoyed is the movie titled We Bought a Zoo. It's basically, that's what happens in the movie. He buys a zoo. It's not too complicated. But it's a lot of fun to watch. I, en I enjoy it. And part of him buying the zoo, he's got two kids. He's got a teenage son and, a, and an elementary age girl. And they buy the zoo to kind of help him cope with the loss of his wife. His, his wife passes away before you see in the movie. And it's a lot of fun. It's really exciting. It's cool just to see what happens. But part of the process in the movie is the relationship between Benjamin and me, the dad, and his son. They kind of butt heads a lot. And they have this time to really bond. And the teenage son, there's this girl he likes. And, you know, like every teenage boy who loves to go to their dad, hey, can you give me some advice on how to date girls? But he does. And his dad begins to tell the story about the first time he met his wife and how that went. He talks about just how scared he was just so scared to go up and talk to her because he saw her in this window of this coffee shop and he just knew he had to talk to her. And here's the advice he gave his son. He goes, you know... Sometimes all you need is 20 seconds of insane courage, just literally 20 seconds of just embarrassing bravery, and I promise you something great will come of it. I love that quote because it's so true. If we just give 20 seconds of insane courage, great things will happen. You want to change the mindset of being timid to having boldness? Ask God for courage. Ask God to give you the courage that you need to make a bold move. And sometimes it's simple as asking for a small amount of courage, 20 seconds to make a major impact, because in 20 seconds of courage, you can invite a friend to church. In 20 seconds of courage, you can confess sin. In 20 seconds of courage, you can stand up for your beliefs in Jesus. That 20 seconds of insane courage in the face of oppositions will change people, will change you. So if you want a mindset of boldness, you want to respond to the opposition with boldness, ask God for courage. Don't ask God to help you be safe and comfortable, because that's what we want to do sometimes. God, miss, make this easier, make this safer for me, make this rather stand up. No, ask God to give you scary situations. Ask God to give you opportunities to be bold, and he will give you that courage to be bold in the face of opposition. Peter and John, after they faced the Sanhedrin, they let them go. They went back to the other followers of Jesus, and they celebrated. But they also spent quality time 
praying. And here's what's their prayer in Acts 4.29. They say, now, Lord, consider their hearts and enable your servants to speak your words with great boldness. They didn't pray for safety. They didn't pray for the threats to go away. No, they prayed for boldness in the face of opposition. They prayed for God to give them great boldness. And the way God equips us with boldness is through the power of his Holy Spirit. Because Luke records that Peter was filled with the Holy Spirit before he began to speak. The Holy Spirit is a major part in us feeling powerful and strong and to be able to do good works for Jesus. And the Holy Spirit plays a major part in the book of Acts in the lives of Christians forever. Paul, uh, the author of a lot of the New Testament, wrote to his friend Timothy about the power of the Holy Spirit. In 2 Timothy 1.7, he said, For the Spirit of God gave us, for the Spirit God gave us, does not make us timid, but gives us power, love, and self-discipline. The Spirit of God doesn't make us timid or make us cowards. No, it makes us strong and bold and powerful. And you can have that same mindset of boldness if you ask God to give you courage for the Holy Spirit to empower you. So if you want to be bold in the face of opposition, you want to have that mindset of boldness, connect to the power source in Jesus Christ. Pursue that personal relationship with him. And second, pray for courage. Don't pray for safety. Don't pray for things to become easier, but pray for God to make you bold and courageous to do big things for him. And you do that, and you will face opposition, but you will respond with boldness. So what do we do now? What's our response? Now we make bold moves. Church, it is time for us to make bold moves. If we're going to be the same as the early church, being committed to making bold moves, I'm challenging all of us today to make bold moves in the name of Jesus Christ. Understand, making bold moves is hard. It's scary. It can be challenging and difficult, but it's what we are called to do as followers of Jesus. We will face opposition. It's guaranteed, and we must respond with boldness. So what is your actions going to be today? For some of you, your bold move is inviting that friend, coworker, spouse, or sibling to worship, to step out, to ask them and encourage them to join you as you come on a Sunday morning to worship God. For some of you, it's sharing your story about your faith in Jesus to another person. God has changed your life. You have a story. And God can use that story to encourage someone, to show them Jesus, and to help them see the love of Jesus. Share your story, your stories. For some of you, it's confessing sin that you need freedom from. Sin is gross, it's awful, and it's ugly, but freedom comes from it, and we choose to be bold and to confess sin. And I can speak from personal experience. When you choose to confess, you choose to get out of the darkness, you choose to get out of the hiding, you will find freedom that allows you to do bigger and better things for God than you could ever imagine. Some of you today, your bold move is to confess sin. For some of you, your bold move is saying yes to participate in serving, being a small group leader, joining the sheepdog team, serving in the children's ministry, and the list goes on and on the ways you can serve this church. And some of you have been holding back. You've come up with excuses and different reasons why you don't want to participate, why you don't want to serve. Today is to throw those all to the side and choose to be bold and to serve the kingdom of God to make more complete followers of Jesus. For some of you, your bold move is saying yes to stepping out of faith and to give for the first time or to give in a in a bigger way where you're truly trusting in God to help fund the mission of this church and the global church. We want to trust God with our money. And when we choose to give church, God truly blesses us and takes care of other people. So let's choose to make the bold move to give so that we can continue funding, making more followers of Jesus. For some of you, your bold move is just saying sorry. Some of you haven't talked to people in weeks, months, or even years because you're in some fight, some disagreement, and you haven't talked to in years. And your bold move is to pick up the phone and say, I'm sorry. Maybe your bold move is to finally forgive. Maybe your bold move is to reconcile that marriage, to reconcile that friendship, to reconcile that relationship, to put your pride aside. Maybe your bold move to say you're sorry. For some of you, maybe your bold move is to keep your mouth shut. Some of us are really good at talking, and sometimes we just need to shut our mouths, and we need to listen. We need to listen to the people we've hurt and let them speak, their, speak truth to us and how we've hurt them and then how then we can bring reconciliation to that relationship. 
Sometimes we just need to listen and not to respond with hate, but to respond with love and listen. Maybe your bold move is befriending those that are different than you. We like to stay where it's comfortable, right? With people just like us, people who think like us, believe like us, vote like us. But we're never gonna change the world just staying comfortable with the people we like and not going around people that are different than us. So befriending those who are different than you, befriending those who think differently, believe differently, vote differently. Maybe your bold move is not to go on social media today and argue with those who think differently than you or believe or vote differently, but to go get to know them personally in a face-to-face -face relationship. Maybe your bold move is to get to know people who don't know Jesus and think differently and believe differently than you. And for some of you today, your bold move is saying yes to following Jesus for the first time. Yes, it's the best decision you could ever make. It will change your life and it will leave you to a life of fullness and hope and purpose that you never could imagine with Jesus Christ. Maybe your bold step today is to say, Jesus Christ, you are my Lord and my Savior. What is your bold move going to be? Because it can't be nothing. We gotta do something. And we must remember and believe that God used Peter and John thousands of years ago to do bold things, and he will use us today to bold, do bold and amazing things. A.W. Tozer is a great theologian and some of the best things I've ever read. And he said this, anything God has ever done, he can do now. Anything God has ever done anywhere, he can do here. Anything God has ever done for anyone, he can do for you. Believe that, because God has been doing bold things and using people to do bold moves forever. It was a bold move for David to go against Goliath. It was a bold move for a young virgin girl to say, I will become the mother of Jesus Christ. It was a bold move for Moses to go to the most powerful man in Egypt and say, let my people go. And it was a bold move for Peter and John to leave their lives behind to become followers of Jesus. What's your bold move gonna be today? God, thank you so much for Jesus. And give us all the power that we need to do bold things in the face of opposition. We live in a world, God, that wants to stop your name. And God, I pray that you use us to bring change through boldness in the face of opposition. Give us courage. Give us wisdom and give us direction, God. Help us to stay connected to the power source in your son, Jesus Christ. Help us to ask for courage and help us today to make a bold move. God, you are good. It's your son's name I pray.